di sini. Just a, uh, a quick follow-up to, to that White Cross video. Uh, if you have any interest at all in being a part of that ministry, uh, you can contact Robin here at the church. She would love to chat with you about it. Uh, but there are so many different ways that you can get involved. If uh, Obviously, there is the one of, of people just uh, that come and they, they we, we tear sheets and roll bandages. Um, but also, if you're in um, the medical business at all, if you're a doctor or if you're a nurse or or if you have connections to that, we're always looking for medical supplies that could get sent over. Uh, if you can drive a forklift or a pallet jack, you can be used. If you're, if you're good at Tetris, right, we need to load those containers. And so um, if you'd like to get involved in that, uh, we would love to have you. It's a great thing to be a part of. And thank you again to everybody that, that is involved. You're doing a great thing for the kingdom. And that's what we've been talking about uh, these last number of weeks is Jesus teaching on the kingdom of heaven, helping his disciples and his followers to understand what this life is all about. And he's giving it to them in small little pieces of understanding because it's new to them, this idea of the kingdom of heaven that they've been looking forward to for so long, but it, it doesn't look like the picture in their mind that they were hoping for, this strong warrior king that was going to come and destroy uh, their enemies and, and not understanding that that they, that they really misread uh, this truth that God had given, that there is going to, to be a king that is going to come and he's going to rule with justice and mercy and grace and is going to care for the outcast and the lonely and is going to free us from oppression. But the oppression that Jesus is freeing us from in the kingdom of heaven is not one of a living, physical government army or king, but what we need most desperately, and that's oppression from sin, saving us from ourselves. And so Jesus is helping them to understand in little bits and pieces what the kingdom of heaven is like. Today, he's going to, to have uh, two small parables that we're going to read. Uh, in uh, It only takes about three verses that Jesus says it, so it's going to take me over a half hour to explain uh, those two sentences. Um, but uh, as we lead into that, as you're turning to Matthew chapter 13, um, let me just kind of set the stage with a bit of an illustration. I, I, am, I am not good at games. Name a game. I'm, I'm terrible at it. I don't win uh, uh, ever in anything, um, and it gets pretty depressing. There is one game, though, that my kids and I figured out when they were really little, uh, that we could win, and we would only play it if we knew we could win, and that is the the stuffed animal claw game, you know, like in the entrance of like Walmart and things, uh, because what we discovered is that if if you can find a stuffed animal that's that's not squished or pinched in between all of the other stuffed animals, it will easily come out, right? So there's a there's a little secret. It's called the sugar loaf lump. And if all of the, the stuffed animals are packed together, they're pinched in there, there's no way that that claw is going to be strong enough uh, to pull it out. And so we would always look, and my kids would always be like, Dad, that one's all by itself. Well, here's a dollar. Let's get it, right? So we have a lot of stuffed animals in our basement because I would only do it if I was guaranteed the win. Um, I, uh, not because I'm a Baptist preacher, but uh, but because I'm terrible at at games I don't play poker uh, and uh, so I would I would lose so much uh, every time um, and uh, what I do know about poker though is if you have a royal flush it's a guaranteed win the odds of you having a royal flush being dealt a royal flush are 167 thousand to one right right so so there's uh, if you have a royal flush that's a guarantee that you're gonna win everything on the table uh, so it's almost an impossibility for somebody else at the table to have it at the same time you do. So if you have all of a sudden all of those cards, you do what? You just go all in, right? Because there's no way that I'm going to lose. It is a guarantee uh, that I'm going uh, to get rich. Um, if you want to get out uh, more than what you put in in those instances, you've got to go all in on the guarantee. Here's what Jesus says about the kingdom of heaven and us going all in. Let's stand together. 
As I said, just a, a few verses. Matthew uh, chapter 13, verses 44 to 46. Two parables. The first, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure that's been hidden in a field, when a man found, uh, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Second parable, Jesus says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Let's pray. Father, this is your time to do whatever it is that you desire to do in each and every one of our hearts. So we just come uh, for, for this time and we open up our hearts and say, you do whatever you'd like to do. Uh, if it's surgery, God, then do surgery. If it's healing, heal. Uh, give us your truth. Uh, and, and we praise you for it. Father, too, as we gather to worship this morning, we also acknowledge that we know that there are a number of churches in this southern part of our country right now that are hurting through the storms that have taken place, the loss of so many uh, individuals through it all this morning as they gather. Father, wherever they're gathering, would you grant them peace and comfort and then use us to do whatever you need to use us for uh, to impact the world. We give you praise, and we give you praise for what you're going to do in us now. In your name, amen. You can have a seat. So, uh, obviously, as Jesus is sharing these two parables to help his disciples understand what following him is, is like, um, there's, there's something that, to me, stands out right away. It's actually the drive behind these two parables, and, and that's the emotion that is that, that comes out of this man that stumbles upon a treasure out in a field. It says, with great joy, he goes out and sells everything that he has in order to go and, and buy that field. You can imagine if you were in the crowd that day listening to Jesus tell these stories, which, which just a reminder, happened all the time. That was how rabbis taught God's word to their people. They had, they had a number of illustrations, a number of stories. Those stories would get passed down among generations and different teachers would add different details and different emphasis based on what it is that they wanted their learners to understand. But we could all probably admit, if we put ourselves in the crowd that day, uh, that if Jesus would tell these stories, if we would hear stories, hey, do you hear about the guy? He was just out in the field and he all of a sudden he trips and he looks down and it was a treasure chest, right? That's, that's every kid's dream, right? We, we pretended that. I don't know how many times when I was a kid. Like that if I could just automatically, I would just stumble across a treasure. How amazing would that be? I excitement and joy. The same would go for the merchant who is out looking for fine jewels and comes across the pearl of immeasurable value. Obviously, he, he's, he's going to find it and go, well, I, he try to contain himself because he has to go home and, and, and sell everything in order to come back and make this deal with whoever it was that was selling this pearl. There's excitement in what this treasure and this pearl are, are going to do for the lives of these men. That's the picture that Jesus is painting in this story. In ancient times, uh, there, there were no banks and there were no safety deposit boxes. There was nobody, nobody had a safe hidden behind the picture of the old guy eating his soup and reading his Bible, right, that all of our grandmas had, right? They, they, they didn't have a place that they, that they put uh, their pile of money or jewels that they received. And so if you weren't carrying it on your person, the safest place that you could put it would be in the ground somewhere. And that only, no, only you would know about. So if you owned a field, maybe go right out to the middle of it and dig up a hole and put it in there. Because in Jesus' time, living under Roman oppression, it, it, was, there was, it was nothing to have Roman soldiers just kind of come through for no reason. And if they wanted to ransack your house, they could ransack your house. If word got out that you were wealthy, well, where's your money? They try to shake you down. Where is it? And you're not going to tell them. It's, I hid it out in the pasture with my sheep. And so you just, you kept it uh, out there. And, and there was a, a practice in ancient times that you would take your wealth, you actually would divide it 
uh, into threes. One, uh, some cash that you had on hand so that you could always do business. Um, uh, another, uh, you would transfer, you'd exchange it for precious jewels in case you needed to flee because you were oppressed, to flee to another country. That, that was kind of the currency uh, no matter where you went. And then the third, you would, you would hide it in the ground um, as for safekeeping. There was actually uh, an old uh, ancient Jewish saying that said, wealth and wages uh, make life sweet. Uh, but better than either is finding a treasure. That, that's, that's how often uh, people were known for hiding treasure out in field, but also people stumbling across it. Like having money and, and being paid, uh, you know, your, your wages and your due, that's pretty great to have. But it doesn't even compare to stumbling upon a treasure somewhere. Now, the rule, the law of the day was if you found a treasure on somebody's property, uh, you had to tell that person uh, because it, it's it's their property. And so whether whether it was somebody before them, somebody they didn't know decided to bury it out there, it becomes uh, the property of the person that owns the land. And so you can understand why Jesus in telling the story says this man stumbles across a treasure and he decides I am going to buy that property so that that treasure can be mine. Stumbling upon it, was a surprising gift that you didn't deserve. Uh, but it can be yours if you grab a hold of it. Romans 5, 6 says, says this. Why, why Jesus is, is using this illustration is for us to understand the kingdom of heaven is like this. While we, Romans 5, 8, Paul says, while we were still powerless. In other words, while we were still sinners. While, while we were living lives, as we live our lives in, in our sinfulness and pursuing our own personal selfish passions while we were still sinners Christ died for us he came rescued us gave us something that 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 shouldn't have been ours in the first place but he gave it to us the value of the kingdom Jesus is wanting us to understand is you can't estimate how much salvation is worth I don't know if, if you spend any time watching shows like Antiques Roadshow or Pawn Stars or Storage Wars, but in all of them, you know, somebody brings something like, yeah, this has been laying around my house for a long time. Is this something? You know, and, and some expert looks at it and, and, and says, uh, I've seen some of these before, right? And I've seen some of these go at auction for, and then they, they give some price. The way that they can estimate the value of whatever that person is bringing is based on what that same item has gone for in the past. When it comes to the kingdom, you cannot estimate its value because it's, it's, it's a one of a kind. Salvation cannot be compared to anything else. There's nothing it can be compared to. Its value is absolutely priceless. The question that has to get asked really from its core as we talk about salvation, what Christ did for us is then, then what's, the, what's the value of a life? What's a life worth? And God says that the value of our lives is really only given to us based upon the value of the life of his son that was given up for us freely and willingly. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, he says that the light of Christ has has shown uh, upon you and now shines in your hearts, giving you all knowledge and understanding of the glory of God. And it's a treasure that we then carry around uh, in our hearts only through the power of God. God at work in us because of Jesus Christ. That can be compared to nothing. Jesus says that is like a treasure in a field. More wealth than you could ever imagine and what it can do for your life. So Paul then in 2 Corinthians 4 goes on to say, so when we understand this, you understand what we receive from Christ, it gives us a different perspective on how we see what, what's going on around us in our world today and even in our own lives. Paul says whatever happens in your life, affliction, confusion, persecution, fear, the threat of death, 
You could fill in the blank today with whatever it is that, that weighs you down on a regular basis. Paul says, if you know Christ, then, then what you have is, uh, is grace abounding from God and thanksgiving increasing in your hearts. Like a man who finds a treasure with great joy, he goes out to sell everything that he has. Imagine being his family. Imagine being his wife. And he comes home. He's like, honey, garage sale. Right? We're selling everything. You're crazy. We can't do that. No, we have to. We've got to get. He's so excited about what is to come and what they're going to acquire that he's willing to let go of everything in order to have it. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, for the thanksgiving that, that will overflow out of your hearts. Look beyond what's happening in your life right now and the things that are weighing you down. Understand that they can all go away if you would just lay life aside and you would just run hard after Jesus who willingly gave his life up for you. There's nothing better than Jesus. The parable of the pearl is really showing us the same thing. Here's a merchant that goes out and he's on the hunt for, for precious jewels. And when he sees this pearl, he's an expert. He knows I have to have it. It's going to change my life. It'll change my family's life. So I'm willing to get rid of everything in order to acquire it. Imagine his excitement. He's dedicated himself to, to knowing when, that when he sees something of value, he's going to grab a hold of it. That's what Jesus is saying. Do you see the value in having me in your life? Does it give you joy? Because the kingdom of this world wants us to believe that, that there is nothing to hope for, that it's hopeless, that we've got to then trust in men and women who are put in leadership over us. That's as far as it can go. We have a world that wants to feed us with fear so that it can sell us whatever product they're selling that can mask all of the things that are going on in our lives. We have a world that says if you're not happy, you just have to go get more stuff. Right? And just, just keep searching until you find that thing that just fits you well. Try our product. Your relationship isn't going well? Try a different spouse. Right? Find new friends. Get bigger. Get more power. Make your name greater. The list just goes on and on about here's what you can do to try to receive a treasure of great joy. And Jesus says true joy and happiness and peace and fulfillment is not going to be found in this world. You've been looking in this world, and Jesus says, so that's why I came. Left the glory of heaven to come down to this earth to give you what it is that you're searching for and what it is that you need. Romans 15, 13 says that the God of hope, the God of hope will fill us with all joy and all peace and all power of the Holy Spirit so that you can abound in a life of hope. That word abound in the original translation means your cup runs over. It means to be extremely wealthy, to have more than enough. Jesus Christ gives us the hope that we are looking for beyond any measure than we could ever ask for or, or imagine. We just have to trust him for it. That what, that's what makes us. Jesus gives us our value. Jesus gives the kingdom value. The value of knowing Christ and having him rule over your life is more precious than, than we could ever dream of. It starts with him. But it does come at a cost. There's a cost to following Jesus. There's a cost to discipleship. What would you, what would you be willing to pay for that kind of guarantee, that security in life? Because that's, 
that's really kind of the underlying idea of the hearts of these two men that find what it is that, that they do. This is going to set me up in a better position than where I am right now. This is going to make life better if I have this than all of the other things that I have. So I'm willing to sacrifice all that I have because it's not really a sacrifice because what I'm gaining is going to be more. A treasure that, that never goes away. A treasure that never fades. A treasure that is never going to lose value. What would you pay for it? First of all, I can say this, that the really good news of the gospel is that it's a free gift. It's given to us by God the Father. Ephesians 2.9 uh, tells us this. It's interesting that I, I, I just did a little bit of, uh, of research, I guess, because I was interested in, in what goes on in our world today and this, this pursuit of security, this pursuit of, as Paul had talked about, uh, trying to save ourselves from death. Did you know that the anti-aging industry is a six hundred and fifty thousand or billion or sixty-five billion dollar industry in America right now? Sixty-five billion dollars we spend uh, on on fighting what is not winnable. We're gonna you get older every minute, and I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but everybody dies. Uh, that, is, that, is a, that is a guarantee. But man, do we fight it every day, don't we? We just do whatever we can to, to slow it down because I want to have more time. There's, I, I want to I see more of the world. I want, I want, I want to enjoy this. And it's true. We should, we should enjoy this life. Well, God's given it to us as a gift to be enjoyed, to glorify him and to worship him and to enjoy his creation. It's not, it's not wrong with wanting uh, to grab a hold of this life, but, but Jesus says don't grab, grab a hold of it so tightly that you love it more than you love me. I can tell you this about the anti-aging industry. I love Jesus more than kale, <laughs> more than a spinach smoothie there's a lot of things uh, right that i could throw right up. that'll be my sacrifice right jesus for you i'll give up kale um but but we just have this pursuit all the time of trying to take life into our own hands keep ourselves from death when jesus says i've already done it I i've given you life abundant here and life abundant after you pass from this earth because the kingdom that I'm building here gets even greater when I return. Don't embrace this life so deeply uh, or you will not be able to embrace me. Jesus says in these stories and these men know that that what they've found they, they're willing to sell everything. That Both of them do it. They run off and they sell absolutely everything in order to gain what they want. The picture that's painted with the first man is that he's probably somebody's servant, probably a poor farmer, and he's out in a man's field, and he's plowing, maybe getting ready to plant seed, and he hits something with the plow, realizes it's a treasure. He covers it up, and, and the law says that wherever the treasure is, whoever owns that land, it's now theirs. And so he knows. He said, well, i got to own that land then, but it's going to cost me everything in order to do it. But I'm willing because I know what I'm going to get out of it. What I find interesting and love about the way that Jesus teaches in, uh, in, in the case of, of the man who finds a treasure, he stumbles across it, right? He found it by accident. And, but the man with the pearl uh, has an eye for it and he's a professional and he's looking for it. Uh, I think what Jesus is saying is that, is that the kingdom of heaven is for everybody in between, both extremes. There are some people who don't even know what they're looking for. They can only dream of 
boy, I wish I could have peace. Boy, I wish that there was a way that I could have hope and I could understand what this purpose in life is. And by the grace of God and the leading of Christ, they seem to stumble across the gospel. They, they heard somebody preaching on a street corner, a neighbor, and invited them over to their house. And, and why are you guys so nice? They wandered into a church going, this is, seems to be a place that, that might have the answers for me. This man stumbles across the church. Then there's the other man who, who he knows what he's looking for and he goes out to find it. Jesus says, you will find it. I, I've got this for you. It's my gift to you. And everybody in between. The challenge that, that we're given by both of these men is, are we willing, are we willing to let go of everything? Not that, we, not that we have to, right? This is not a message about that it's terrible to have money or to have a nice house or car. Not that at all. Uh, what it is is are you, would you be willing, if that was getting in the way of you being able to acquire what you need to acquire, this incredible treasure of a relationship with Christ and salvation, would you be willing, are you willing to let go of anything that stands in the way? of you being able to fully follow Jesus? It's a great question for us today. Each and every one of us can sit back and maybe ask the Lord that question. Is there anything in my life that I am holding on to so tightly that, I, that I'm refusing to let go of, that I'm not experiencing the fullness of this hope and joy and peace that you have offered me? God do a work. Uh, and, and, and it's not a painful, it shouldn't be a painful sacrifice. Again, when we measure it up against what Jesus has to offer. That's what I love about how Jesus words it. It says, the man found a treasure and in his great joy went out and sold everything. In other words, he was so excited to get everything, to get rid of everything, because it was going to allow him to go out and grab a hold of something even greater. How many of us, as we start thinking about that, God, is there anything that I have in my life that I need to let go of because it's keeping me from you? And we start to think about those things. Ooh, ouch, ow. It, no, is it in his joy? He was excited. I am going to get rid of this because it is going to allow me to experience the fullness of the value of the treasure for us that is... Christ. One of the most beautiful verses to help us understand this is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, became poor for your sake, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. In order that you would become rich, Jesus became poor. Philippians 2 tells us that he humbled himself, came to this earth, left the glory of heaven for people who didn't deserve it. I, I, I put my life up against Jesus, right? Put, put me on Antiques Roadshow. Well, what is this man worth? Like, well, I've, I've seen people go for a lot more. Right, you, you know, and, and but compared to Jesus, uh, I am nothing. But because of what Jesus did and sacrificing Himself, I'm. What are we told in Scripture? I'm, I'm God's masterpiece. I'm His handiwork through what Christ did for me. His death gives us incredible value, incredible purpose. Each and every one of us. Lost in our sin, and Jesus came and left the glory of heaven for us. And now gives us incredible purpose. The transactions that take place in these stories uh, show a great exchange. Giving up everything in order to, to gain more. 
more specifically, they gave up security. Security that they have they had earned in order to receive an unearned gift of security, more than anything that this world has to offer. Matthew 19, there's a rich young ruler that approaches Jesus, and he says, what do I need to do to gain salvation? Jesus knows this man's heart. So it's not a blanket statement for every person, but Jesus knows what's going on in this man's heart. And, and, and he knows that this man ha- is incredibly wealthy, and that's where he finds his identity. That's where he finds his trust and his hope. That, that's where he finds his purpose in his his stuff. And Jesus said, if you want to be one of my disciples, I want you to go and I want you to give everything that you have to the poor and then come and follow me. And it's heartbreaking. It says that the man went away sorrowful because he had so many possessions. In other words, he didn't follow Jesus because he knew what it was going to cost him. He was going to have to let go of everything that he worked for, everything that he held dear, everything that that he found his security in. The disciples kind of pulled Jesus aside after that, and and they're like, Jesus, if, if that's what people have to do in order to follow you, like, this is pretty ridiculous. What in the world? How, is, how can anybody be saved? If, you, if you've got to let go of, of this world, how can anybody be saved? And Jesus' response is pretty simple. With God, all things are possible. If you want it, uh, he'll... He will help you to do what it is that you need to do. To let go of what you need to let go of in order to follow him. And and let me just say, it doesn't have to be monetary. For, for some people, some, some have to let go of addictions. Give them over to the Lord. Stop hanging on to those for security. Some people have to let go of their past being wronged by people, bitter, angry, because it gives us, right, if we, if we get to dwell in that, that, that we're the victim all the time, we can use that against other people, and, and people start to, to take that as their story, and, and that becomes their identity. To let go of that means I got to let go of my security, my permission to hate the world and to get angry with people, to be short with people. I got to let that go. Jesus said, yeah, I died for that too. And I died for your addictions. I died for your obsessions. I died for you. And everything that's inside of you, are you willing, are you willing to let go of everything so that you could have more than everything? With God, all things are possible. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And it goes the opposite as well. Wherever your heart is, that will know what your treasure is. The question that we have to ask ourselves today is, what's my treasure? There's a great old uh, story, parable that I heard years ago. But a little girl named Jenny, and Jenny's mom took her to the, the drugstore. She had to go shopping, and they get to the counter to pay, and there's just this little rack of necklaces there that every parent dreads, any rack on a countertop, right? We're, we're buying that today, sticky hand that whips against the wall, whatever it is. Jenny wanted uh, saw a pearl necklace, $2.50, just a plastic pearl necklace, and she wanted it so bad. Oh, Mom, that's so beautiful. That would be so great if I could get it. And her mom, being a great mom, said, well, let's go home, and I'll give you some tasks around the house, some chores. Maybe Grandma and Grandpa would like to be a part of this, too. And so do some work for them, and, and you can earn a little bit of money and buy it for yourself. And so Jenny did. She was so excited. She got home and had her little $2.50 pearls, and she wore them all the time, all day long, all night long, never took them off. Took him to school every week. It was her show and tell. She loved her pearls. One night, her dad went into her, into her room like he did every night and was uh, reading her a bedtime story and, and, and noticed that she was always just a- adoring her necklace. And he said, he said, Jenny, do you love me? She said, yeah, Daddy, you know, I love you more than anything. He said, can I have your pearls? Oh, Dad. Uh, you can have any of my stuffed animals. 
You can have anything in but just don't take my pearls. The next night he came in, same routine, read her a bedtime story. She's distracted. She just loved her pearls so much. Jenny, do you love me? Daddy, you know I love you. Can I have your pearls? Anything but my pearls, Dad. This went on for quite some time, and one night Jenny knew Dad wasn't going to stop. So she just sat on the edge of her bed and tears rolling down her face. She knew dad was going to come and ask. And the only way that she's like, the only way I can show him that I love him, obviously, is I have to give up my necklace. So dad came in, and right away she said, Daddy, you know that I love you more than anything in the world. And he said, well, thanks, Jenny. And she said, so here's my pearls. And dad reached in his pocket, pulled out a little blue velvet bag, and inside was a real string of pearls. And he said, I've been wanting to give these to you for so long, but I just needed you to give up the thing that you loved so that you could have something better. That's the gospel. Our father gave his life up for us, and it's offered to us as a free gift. He says, but I I need you, in order to receive the best life, I need you to give me your imitation life, the one that you think is best, but I'm going to give you something better. For each and every one of us, we have to ask ourselves today, what would I be willing to give up? What am I willing to give up to have the best life? Let's pray. Father, we just ask today that you would help us this life that you have saved us to, that we would go all in. God, we want to experience life to the fullest. Forgive us when when we pursue the things that we think are best for us when we know deep down that they're not. Help us, Holy Spirit, to recognize imitation in order to grab a hold of the pearls of great price. Jesus, we love you. We thank you that even in spite of our mistakes, that you continue to love us. God, that you continue to rain down your mercy upon us and your care. Help us to just run hard after you. We love you. We praise you. Amen.